Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lizard Brains Podcast. I'm your host, DJ Allison Drini. I'm joined by my co-host, Tom Gorman. Tom, how are we doing today? I'm good. You look tan. Uh, thanks, Tom. I am tan. <laughs> and kind of hot. <laughs> uh, before we uh, started the recording, I was telling Tom that my air conditioner is broken. I thought it was like a $12 capacitor, Tom. Um, but no, it's a, it's a leak in the EVAP, which apparently is not something you just fix. So I need a new one. And you can't just replace the evaporator. You have to replace the whole thing. Dude, you're going to go from flirting with being a car guy to flirting to being like a house guy. Uh, I'm basically HVAC professional now, <laughs> yeah. except, except all the parts where it involves me uh, installing it. So, it. yeah, so I, I have to pay somebody else to do that. That sucks. Yeah, so that's... Um, hey, it, prop it up the economy. Go for it, kid. I, you know what? I, uh, I, I think uh, if, if, you're, if you know some HVAC, like it's kind of important. Like maybe not so much in the in the north where we live. Like I don't think anybody's uh, dying from the from the May first temperatures right now. But I don't know. I'm like I'm still kind of hot from trying to shower after I worked out because it's like 85 degrees here today. I don't know how hot it is there. Uh, it's probably about it's 80. Hot. It's probably about 80 something. But remember, I'm in the basement most of the day because that's where my simmer rig is. Um, so the fan basement. It's it's pretty good. It's 59 degrees in in New York. Okay, well. Way to rub it in, Joel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, flip side, guys, uh, if you want to help support DJ's air conditioning budget, we have merch. And as of Friday, <laughs> from budget. May 5th, no, May 3rd to May 7th, everything is 20% off on the Lizard Brains uh, storefront. So, so you can go get a national championship shirt. You can go get a Lizard Brains sticker or mug. I only need to sell about 5,000 of those to pay for the AC unit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, if we make 5,000 sales between May 3rd and May 7th, we can do it. We got this. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm really lucky that Christine saves money. <laughs> let's yeah. let's just say that. <laughs> Good point. So uh, I would have to sell my jet ski. I yeah. If I, I had would, that kind of cost pop up. I would I would just have to like actually sell the fit instead of talk about selling the fit. I would have to like actually sell the fit to pay for it. Yeah. So maybe I should do that anyways. Yeah, we'll wait till the next maybe. thing breaks. Oh, and then uh, we're starting the show late because, um, uh, you know, Lugod, I've been having thoughts about the Civic. If, if anybody needs a real fancy transmission, uh, holler at me. I might, I might just uh, pull it out of the car. But um, <clears throat> uh, as I was uh, trying to get ready for, because we have one lap coming up. So, like, there's a lot of, like, things that involve being a normal human and living that you, like, have to take care of before you leave for a week. And so I, I finished working for the day and I'm like, oh crap, this is literally the last chance I get to mow, mow the lawn because tomorrow right after work, I'm going to a band rehearsal for the last time before like two weeks from now when I get to go again. Um, and uh, as I was like running down my porch to like scramble and mow the lawn real quick, uh, a, a step on the porch like disintegrated it, like, like the, the board flipped off and like, like now there's a gaping hole in my porch. So I had to like, go find wood screws and put my porch back together. So I still buy a house. <laughs> it's fine. How many people do you think, how many people do you think are homeowners in this, in the podcast listenership? I bet I'm on the minority of renters. I, I bet most people have houses. Cause wh who, what kind of motorsports people aren't at least put together enough to sort of have, I don't know. I think most people own houses. I'm going to, we're going to do a straw poll. What we're does that mean? That's uh, I'm going to make a poll and then, uh, and then people are in the audience are going to take it. All 15 of them. Wow. Yep. <laughs> Guys are <laughs> counting on you for the content. Yeah, here. we need it. We need it. <laughs> Excuse me. While you're doing that, how was your weekend? You had a fun weekend. I did. I had a great weekend. Uh, I got to drive, uh, with Peter Schnorr on Saturday. We drove his, uh, completely stock GR86. Remember how I, the last GR86 I drove, like wouldn't turn because I had way too much no. front sway bar. Well, this had, wait, what are you trying to say about my car? Oh, I forgot that I drove yours. All right. Tom. Mine's a BRZ. Uh, you were right. You were right. I yeah, just had yeah, to yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I think I, I think I have the, the poll created. Sorry. I'm trying to multitask here, guys. I'm, I apologize. All right. I am going to post it in the chat. 
and then you guys just just answer away. <clears throat> All right. There should be a question mark at the end of that statement, but I didn't put one in because I was hurrying. Uh, so anyways, uh, the last GR86 I drove was uh, Paulo's, and he had like all the front sway bar in it to the point where it felt like it was broken. He has since now fixed it, he tells me, um, but I, I still haven't driven the car. And uh, so I drove our, the, our SSC car um, is down on power and, uh, and it's bugging Peter. So he really wanted to drive his daily driver, which is a GR86. Uh, so he bought tires for it. And then we went and autocrossed on like sticker Bridgestones uh, for the day. And so it's just like the car is a hundred percent stock. Everything on it is stock. Even the alignment, it's like from the factory alignment, like the alignment's not even touched. Uh, and, uh, there was, uh, Paulo was there and, and a couple other like fast E street people. The, the class had 15 people in it in, at a local or 13 or something like that. And I freaking won wow. in a stock GR86. <laughs> I, um, hey, hey. it was, thanks Tom, Tom's, Tom's applauding. Um, it was very, very difficult to drive because the inside rear tire would be lifted on the entry of every corner. So when you went to go put down power, you would just get like literally inside wheel spin. So you had to like barely tip into the throttle just to shift enough, enough weight where the diff would actually do diff things. And then you could feed in power. But like you had to be like so, so gentle on it um, yeah. to like actually leave a corner. Uh, so it was it was it was a good exercise of like doing tiptoe and. Uh, to like, you had to be very diligent where the weight was. I know you drove my car in the wet, but my car still does that. Even with, I have proper camber, I would say, but everything else is basically going to be the same. Uh, it's a little lower if that, it won't change much, but <clears throat> yeah, mine does the same exact problem where it's just like, it wants to spin the inside wheel so badly. Yeah. <laughs> that, so badly. I was just like, you kind of have to just drive through it. Like you, if you know that the car is going to rotate really aggressively because it's just going to spin the wheel and then catch like you just have to be like planning for it and like open your hands the moment it happens so that you don't like veer off course or like over rotate or spin you know if the car had like if it had a functional diff like it has a diff but it, it you can't have the inside tire completely unloaded for with a torsion or it, it doesn't actually lock at all like you need to have some yeah. kind of grip on the inside tire if it had like a diff from like i don't know what kind of diffs bmws have but I've never felt a BMW diff that like spun the inside uh, rear tire. Um, Lou God said it's a ZF diff. That that means nothing to me. But it's whatever <laughs> whatever kind of diff it is. Um, it's a company. It's not a it's not a type. It's a company of diff. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What you're yeah. looking for is clutch type. Yeah, DJ. It's a clutch type diff. ZF only makes clutch type diffs. You know what? Zero. Like, <laughs> do you know anything about cars? Ugh, so annoying. Well, okay, Carl. Carlton, you know they make the eight speeds in the BMWs too, right? Yeah, the the ZF transmission. It's very reliable. It's actually the transmission that's in a Supra, uh, which is highly rated according to all the car reviews that I listen to and watch on a regular basis because that's what car guys do. <laughs> I'm so stressed that I might have got that wrong, but no one in the live chat started calling me out for it, so I think I got that right. <laughs> no, I think you got Ooh. it right. <laughs> so, um. If it Fun had, fact, like... ZF also made the shocks on my B-Spec car. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow, what, what, what kind of company is that? Anyways, uh, if it had like a clutch plate, uh, uh, clutch? clutch? Clutch type. If it had a clutch type diff, I think the way it drives stock would actually be freaking amazing. Like it would be like actually good. Um, I mean, it was still fun, but like the, the pace of the car was definitely hampered a lot by just... Um, by not being able to like, you know, get in power. Yeah. So Peter's, Peter's going nuts with his uh, daily driver. He, he already has a car sit bar. He bought Coney's for it. He has a set of wheels. So, um, I might be driving D street for a little while, Tom. Nice. I mean, they look fun. I like my car. I assume if you get a handling, did he buy a front bar or a rear bar? Is it going to push like a pig? Like that other one did it a front bar, but it's the smaller bar and we're planning on running it on its softest setting. So apparently that's what Paulo did. And, and you know what? Watching Paulo's car on course, it, did, it, it actually did look like it turned. Yeah. So gotcha. I think he had the, the larger bar before. And when I first jumped in the car, it was like, it was at like three or four out of like the five settings. So it was like the stiffest it would be. So that's why it didn't turn. So. Copy. 
And then on uh, Sunday, I got to get some one lap practice in. Uh, Mike Kubiak, uh, one of my coworkers, uh, let me drive his Z06 uh, Corvette that uh, normally does uh, street GT in uh, grid life. And he does uh, Max 2 in uh, like a CCA time trials. So it's a, it's a Z06 with like some coilovers and uh, some really big wheels and tires on it. Uh, and it makes like just over 400 horsepower. I think it was like 410 or whatever. Because I've never driven a fast car around pit race. And Tom always you said, think? Tom always said, I would like pit race if I drove a fast car around there. I will say it is better. But man, I hate turn one. It's like so you hate turn one. Yeah, it's so unrewarding. Maybe it's because I've never actually you know taken that corner right. I was going to say, can I call you out? Because on the video, you went way too slow through it. That's why it's unrewarding. All right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no. So the lap before that, I actually like had enough speed where like I I like the car carried out to the edge. Yeah. Um, but then I got behind in the S's. So that wasn't my fastest lap for the, for the weekend. Uh, gotcha. but the, the, the Corvette had like these like super boosted brakes. It was so hard to control the car and the brakes. I felt like, like my race car is like, you're using your big toe. This was like, I was using like little toe hairs to like control the brakes. It was tough, Ooh. dude. <laughs> hobbit toes <laughs> yeah if i had hobbit toes it might have been a little bit easier my my big toe was like it was a little too ripped up for uh for the for the proper amount of braking that this uh, car needed um huh. so i it was i would like be hunting for that like right amount of brake pressure where the car like kind of pivots in and then on that particular lap i was like it was like starting to do it and then by the time it started to do it i was like ah oh, crap I need to get on throttle. So then I just got on throttle. If you watch the video, I literally give my head like a little like, ah, oh, crap, shake. Cause I'm like, oh, dang it. So, and I knew that was my last session. I wasn't planning on doing the last session in the car. So, so that was, uh, gotcha. I, I did a practice session, a, a flyer. And then that was, that was my next, uh, that was my next time in the car. So that was the, the third, it was the sixth lap in the car essentially. Um, sure. so, but, I, I know I messed up a little bit in one um, and then I overslowed a little bit in turn five before going up the hill. Um, and then the car slowed down much faster than it did in the previous times when I broke for the entry into the S's It like the car just like sucked down speed and it didn't really do that before. So, um, so then I turned in and I was like, Oh crap, I'm too slow. Uh, and then the rest of the lap I was pretty happy with, but, but yeah, there's like, there's like little nuances there where I think if I got a, a uh, couple more sessions in the car or just had a handle on how sensitive the brakes were. Um, then I think, I think I could have done a, done a better job, but I was, I was happy with uh, the practice that I got together because any car I've ever driven there was flat through the kink and Mike's might've maybe kind of, maybe it could have been like a half a lift, um, but I wasn't going to yeah. risk it, but about the amount of send I went in is going to be the amount of send I do in one lap. So it was, it was sure. relevant to um how i went into the kink also i was afraid of gm abs in that spot especially after Edo's <laughs> yep. incident i was just gonna bring up that so i think the other theory that i have about why you don't like it's not like a top five track for me it's maybe a top 10 but i'm surprised you don't like it like exponentially more than a slow car but you ran a what a 152 7 is that what i saw 52 everyone seemed like um uh devin keeling was there and he's done a 48 before and the car's mm -hmm. faster now, and he could only do a, a 51. So the track was, like, really not in a good spot for some reason. Weird. Like, everyone was two so to three was seconds off of where they normally were. My Camaro, I did a 148 in that car, which puts into context, like, how freaking crazy that car was. I wish that, I never sold it. Yeah, but that car was sick. Maybe you just need to go, like, four seconds faster still, and you'll like it even more. <laughs> the track. <laughs> I, I, bet, I, bet my mis uh, but, I bet my mistakes, like, cost me, like, Cause uh, like, especially the overslowing for uh, turn one, um, that probably cost me like more than a half second uh, just cause the extra speed I could have carried down a long straight after that. Uh, and then yep. into the S's, that's probably like another couple of 10. So I, I definitely think like, like probably like second to two seconds. Like if I was like freaking on it, like if I was really dialed into that car that I maybe would have been able to get. Um, but for like my sixth lap in the car, uh, I was happy with it. And I was also highly aware of the brakes after the kink with my Camaro. So I, I get you on the GM 
uh, break thing there. Yeah, I did not want to. Because there's not really out. a lot of. I've 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 responded to incidents in that corner as a track night staffer before, and I like you just don't have a lot of runoff. You go into a wall pretty quick. Yeah, it's like a lot of tires, but it's not a fun. I would not want to go off there. I wouldn't want to go in the office if I threw Mike's uh, car into a wall. So no, <laughs> that would be no, a no, bad no, no, day. No. The uh, I'm excited to drive the GT3 there. I think that car. I'm curious to see how it actually is on raw pace because the tracks that I thought it'd be pretty good at last year. It was like mediocre, and the tracks that I was not even on my radar are the tracks we did the best at. So I don't really know what to expect. I was I was talking with Peter. I was wondering like how much faster the Cayman would be, and Peter's probably like, ah, that's probably about like the time that you end up with. But I do think I'll be faster in the Cayman, mostly because the brakes are much easier. So like I'll be able to just carry more speed through everything because I'll just have like a better control and understanding of the car. The brakes were sure. so hard to control on the car. I have a new theory. You're not a car guy. You're a brake guy. <laughs> Both yeah. by, career, by career, by career, <laughs> by all of it. <laughs> it's just, yeah, I'm very picky when it comes to brakes. Honestly, I really am. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know what you want. You know your brakes. You know, you know things about them. Like, brake guy. Yeah. Just, uh, I, I was like, I was like almost curious if we like took away the brake booster, like what the brakes would feel like. Ooh, I don't know about that. I've never driven a car that was supposed to have boosted brakes and didn't and liked it. Did I, did I, did I say that right? Yeah. I've never driven a car that was meant to have boosted brakes, but didn't have it. And it was a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Ever. Right. Or maybe just like a different master cylinder or something, something like I was telling Mike, I'm like, you're making your life way harder than it needs to be. But like with these, with this like current brake setup. I'm going to have to ask him if he changed it because I drove the car at 2021 or one, maybe at road America for a reference lap when I worked with them a little bit and I didn't have any complaints, but I also, I'm not, I'm not as picky. So I don't know if I just like didn't register, uh, but I don't remember something weird being, I don't remember something weird. Normally it's like, well, that's weird, but whatever. Yeah. Well, you might be used to it. I like, you might've driven cars with that sensitive brake of brakes before. So you're just like, oh yeah, it's just a, it's just a big toe braking thing maybe maybe yeah like the civic was now pretty, you got a tool about yeah the the civic was pretty sensitive on the brakes but um it wasn't it wasn't hard to pivot in it had like a really wide window for the braking application for it to like for you to balance it on its nose this car had a narrow window and the brakes were really sensitive got it so it, it just felt like um it just felt like i was uh like under driving like all the entries forever that's what it felt like sure or overdriving it because <laughs> sometimes you get in that like sweet spot and then next thing you know the car's pivoting super fast and uh you're like oh wait okay i wasn't ready for that <laughs> so it was it was a little, little tough huh. in that that aspect but the the rest of it like okay so pit race is much more fun in a fast car especially when you're going up that hill that i normally yeah. have only de-accelerated up it was actually fun yeah. to accelerate up the hill yeah um like chasing the back end just a little bit up uh, the hill yeah, yeah. up like 10 stories but you whatever still, yeah but you still have that compression so like you can be like like full in the power as it like eats yeah dude it was uh yep. it was it was pretty fun and then um and then the s's coming back onto the old track uh was really fun because like you're Very just kind of carrying slip angle like all the way to the edge and you're like kind of like coming down a hill and you're like transitioning between like one track to the other and it it just feels cool like <clears> that that part of the the track felt really cool. The the best part of pit race is that section followed by like the next three corners. If I could just do that section over and over again, I think I would like pit race. Like if it had a short track that turned right after the middle of the back straight instead of kinking left. Yes. Got it. Hundred percent. I'll I'll put in a word. I'll see if they can yeah, actually yeah, add just, that short course. Yeah, I don't I don't think it would be that tough. Like, just get the paver out there. It seems like everyone's paving tracks nowadays, so I'm sure yeah. they uh, I'm sure it's cheap. Just go out there and stamp the grass down a little. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you can just <laughs> rally the, rally cross track. Yep, and then you just have the paver drive over, and it's good to go. Right. Well, I'm jealous. I didn't do anything nearly that exciting this weekend. So you had. Uh, I'm glad you did two events because that means that I did my none offset. Yeah, right. I That's made, uh, lizard brain mass. I made up for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I just went to Cincinnati for my brother's um, my brother's uh, gender reveal party for his child. So I found out I'm going to have a little niece in October. Congratulations, Brennan and Andrea. Uh, but yeah, that was it. I did play. I had a little thing that I was going to bring up on the podcast. 
that I thought was an interesting topic relative to what we talk about. Yeah. We played, um, have you ever played Redneck Golf? You know what that is? No. That sounds like a cornhole or something. It is. It's a yard game, but it's like a little ladder. It's like a, there's three rungs on the ladder mm. or hillbilly golf. Yeah. Yeah. One of those two. Uh, it's like a one, two, three ladder. And then there's golf balls on a string that you'd like a, like a nunchuck almost. And you just like throw it underhand and they spin through the air and then they wrap around the pole. And if you get it on the top pole, it's one point. Each pole is a different point. And I would played it before, but not in a while. And I was playing it and I sucked at it. But I realized that the reason I was like, I was done playing the game halfway through. I was like, this is boring. But <laughs> the reason it sucked is because I couldn't practice fast enough to like get better at it. Because you had to wait. Because, because the, well, you had to wait for the other people to play. But also the balls got t like tangled in each other every single throw so badly that, uh, that you just are like wasting time. Like the three throws that you get to do are like 10% of playing that game. Which I know it's like a yard game and you're like standing there with a drink in your hand and stuff. But it was vivid to me about the, the concepts we talk about, about like you have to be able to go repeat the thing that you want to try practicing quickly. The quicker you can do it, the better you can get like the instantaneous, the faster you can get better at yeah, it. Yeah, the instant feedback. Exactly. And I was like, man, if I could just like stand here with 20 of these things and then practice, I would feel a lot better about it. But I get so bored in the 90% of the time that I can't play that the 10% that I suck at it is just like not even interesting. And I wondered if that's like how people feel at autocross. Cause we think autocross is like pretty fast rep. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I, I was like thinking of, as I'm throwing these stupid golf balls to the air, like, is this what people think autocross is like? <laughs> <laughs> Whitney said yes, but I don't think, uh, I don't think Whitney was saying yes to, um, to uh, exactly what you said. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think, but yeah, I think was, she's that was, uh, excited that was about the hillbilly thing. golf. <laughs> oh, that she's was the saying, only relevant thing I did this weekend. She's saying why she like why she dislikes it. I've never played it, but um, even cornhole, like I just I feel like I don't have the patience for it because you're like sitting yeah. there like waiting to like do the thing again. I think it needs to be yeah, those. I mean, those things are obviously so social. Maybe that's part of the reason some people don't like autocross is if it's not social enough. It is a very social day. It's a very social day, and then and then you have the time where like you focus on the thing. That's, we've talked about this before, but I don't know why people go to car shows. You do all the stuff at a car show that you would do, but then you don't get to go have fun. Like you do all the socializing yeah, and then you don't get to go drive. I, I can't even remember the last car show I went to. I can. We, we did a car show at, for ASM um, at a brewery up in Wisconsin last summer, but I wasn't there to like look at cars. I was there to like hang out and drink. <laughs> with like read a brewery with a bunch of my friends i don't know anyway that was the only relevance thing that i had this weekend so <laughs> the relevant thing <laughs> dom did for the podcast was play hillbilly yeah. golf <laughs> <laughs> play hillbilly golf. yep well <clears throat> i'm glad uh i'm glad you had had fun with that tom did you win yep. no i said i sucked at it remember <laughs> well that you you could still win and think you sucked no, 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 no. I was like genuinely bad at it. Well, I couldn't figure it out. I, I was bad at axe throwing too. I don't understand. I don't know if it's like a rotating thing or like a throwing thing. I'm just bad at all of that stuff. Well, I don't have good aim. Well, what's crazy is like you have like this good, like this such a good spatial awareness. Yeah, maybe something about like objects like moving through the air spinning, like your brain doesn't compute well. I'm bad at frisbee, football, basketball. Weirdly, I was good. At, I'm good at volleyball. I don't understand why I'm good at that one. Uh, and then the spin like doesn't, all the yard sports. The spin doesn't matter. It's when it spins, it breaks, it breaks you. Maybe, but I'm still bad at cornhole. I guess those spin. I'm pretty good at tennis and ping pong. There's something, there's something there. I wonder what that is. If anyone knows about sports, <laughs> <laughs> let me know. Uh, Tom, you, you mentioned that we, you wanted to do this uh, survey on uh, the podcast. Uh, was there a specific Ooh, reason? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Was there a specific reason why? Yeah, it's about autocross. It asks a couple of interesting questions. If you guys didn't see, the SCCA put out like a, what do, you, what do you want from autocross as a sport? Just like as a whole scope of what is autocross for? What do you like? What do you not like? And I took it and I was like, this is kind of interesting. It made me think about a couple of things. I thought maybe we could like, because you haven't taken it yet, so you should. Maybe we could like blow through it real quick and it might be a little bit interesting. Okay, I'm down. Um, 
first the poll results. It's a thirty-three percent of our audience owns a house, and sixty-six percent doesn't. So you're not. Maybe this is why there are people. <laughs> the only <laughs> look, look. Full disclosure: the only way I own a house is uh, because Christine's parents gave us a very generous gift. I don't know how anybody my age actually owns a house. Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah. I'm, I don't I don't even want to own a house to be honest though. Um but well, we need to break into the homeowner market for this podcast to expand I think. That's <laughs> that's what I'm seeing. <laughs> we need to get that up at least like 33%. No, it sounds like we need to break into the renters market to like actually connect with the most amount of people. No, that we already have done. That's 66% of them. No, no, it was 66% doesn't own a house. Yeah, that's what I mean. 66% are renters. So we already have that covered. Oh, maybe it's that homeowners don't have time to listen to podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're fixing their porch and and busy trying yeah. to figure out how they're going to pay for air conditioning. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, All right. <clears throat> uh, but so yeah, I don't. I mean, maybe this will be quick and silly. But yes, Richard posted it in the live chat. If you're listening live, you want to listen. But it is uh, take it. Oh yeah, I don't know. I I liked the uh, I liked some of the questions they asked. Okay, is it some the, of it's real quick? Is it the 2024 SCCA solo discovery survey? Mm, I don't remember what it's called. Okay, it's this it, awesome. Everyone needs to take this survey. I think that's the one that I'm. It's on Survey Monkey. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here I'll share my screen. Oh, I can't share my screen. Why can't I share my screen? Maybe because I am. Uh, try unsharing your screen. Let's see. Oh, yep, yep. That's what it is. Oh yeah, by the way, we're on video now if you want to join our YouTube channel. Okay, so join, the the subscribe. first the first question of the survey is how old am I? Oh no, Tom, I'm in the I'm in this bracket now. I'm in the 35 to 39 bracket. <laughs> you are. Dude, the first time I felt old was when I went from the 18 to 24 to the 25 to 34. I was like, "Oh. That was a well, long time ago." I've now. ascended past that. So, <laughs> dang it. All right. So, <laughs> all right. Current member. It asked me how much money I uh, make. Uh, describe your yeah, current the attitude bits. towards the towards autocross par par participation. Um, uh, looking to be competitive nationally. Okay. All right. Wait, wait. You gotta slow it down. You gotta read off the options once oh. they get to the real questions here. Okay. Start. Yeah. Start now. Start here. All right. <clears throat> Rank the types of events below based on what you prefer. Most attractive to least attractive. Okay. So, uh, it, is there only three options yet? Yeah. Okay. So the it's three options. All right. So it's competition, test and tune and school. Uh, so from where I'm at right now, I, I want the competition the most. Um, that's what I put too. Yep. Yeah, and then test and tune mostly cause a lot of keys get thrown around and that's really fun. And then school. But if I, if we were doing the school, cause our, like doing our school was like, like very rewarding. I literally yeah. gave up a competition to, cause uh, Charlotte was going on that weekend. So I think this means like taking the school though, for this, for the purpose of this survey. Right. I think so. But it'd be interesting if they're trying to find out if people want less competition, wouldn't it? Like more open run test and tune style. Yeah, I'm wondering why the national office would care about that. I don't know. Um, okay, then what kind of organizations do you belong to or participate with? Okay, so it says... You would be both. Right, so it says uh, SCCA only, SCCA and other organizations, non-SCCA organizations, or uh, none at the moment. All right, so I'm going to do SCCA and other. <laughs> Literally just because Akron Sports Car Club is a thing. <laughs> yep. Um, <clears throat> What types of autocross do you participate in now? And it says select all that apply. Um, I'm going to completely ruin the survey and click none yet and then click other things. No. Um, <laughs> Just be a troll. <laughs> Take it for Carlton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So regional, uh, I'm going to pick, yep, regional, national. Yep, going to select that. Uh, pro solo, I'm going to do that. Uh, Non-SCCA local club events. And then high profile slash professional events. Um, I would do those, but I don't have a car and I haven't been invited to do it. So that's what do you well, think they mean by that? Do you think they mean like pro racing or do you think they mean like king of the mountain? I think that, yeah, like UMI or like, um, uh, maybe even like Optima stuff like that. 
interested if they thought that was professional, but regardless. I think okay, what types of autocross do you currently not active in, but you would want to do? Hold on. I, I think they put that in there because the people participating in those things, that's what they would pick. I actually think Pro that's pretty probably. smart. Like they wouldn't pick like, 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 I don't know, like autocross for money events, which I guess that it like by definition, that is kind of uh, like pro professional or whatever. Right. Sure. So, okay. The next one, hold on, I'm fixing the, the scaling of our window. All right. What types of, I'm autocross... realizing as we do this, <laughs> hang on, I'm realizing what? as we do this, the interesting stuff is pretty back heavy. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> okay. Okay. Like okay. So, well, all right. We'll, we'll go faster through this. What types of autocross do you uh, currently not active in, but would like uh, to participate in, in the future? I'll pick the high profile events. That sounds fun. Uh, all right. Uh, what, be what best describes the vehicle you autocross? Um, <laughs> Other people's. <laughs> <laughs> I forget. Um, is that an option? Uh, oh, it is an oh, option. Is. Okay. Um, I autocross by sharing a vehicle I don't own. Yep. That is, that's definitely the way to phrase that. <laughs> um, cool uh yeah i guess that's the only thing i can answer really i mean i think if i did like you oh uh, you you probably picked like um fun occasional car that i use for autocross right did you select that box i think i said both options are autocross only primarily autocross but can be driven on the street primarily street but can autocross fun and occasional autocross or just autocross other other people's cars i think i did the the occasional for fun and my uh, and other people's. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Uh, I like that they put like autocross is such a special uh, sport where they like they put this as an option, like driving other people's cars. Like, yeah, no other form of motorsports is like that's going to be as prevalent, right? I think they would cut participation by like thirty percent, probably at least, if probably. everybody had to own their own car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah, autocross is like the coolest thing ever, guys. All right, anyways, uh, if preparation. For autocross slash solo rules were not a factor, what modifications most interest you? All right, there's got to be some kind of. Uh... I giggled at this. I'm curious what you're going to say. The options are wheels, suspension, bolt on power, engine and transmission swaps, added and modified forced induction, internal engine modifications, and aero. And you can pick as many as you want. I want I want the ability to get proper camber on cars. That's what I want most more than anything suspension and, okay and and wheels because like running these like um these like little tiny baby wheels with like big balloon to like pinch tires on it's kind of silly yeah i only put wheels because I, everything else is either hard to install and work on or makes the car <laughs> less reliable and both of those things suck so well, i put literally only wheels <laughs> so i i feel like i i should probably do that because suspension is like that's such a broad thing right yeah all I want is camber plates. That's really all I want. But that's what that's what would fall under suspension. You could put that in the last little. What else do you want to add to this survey? <laughs> Be like when I said suspension, I just meant camber plates. Actually, you know what? Yeah. I'll, I'm gonna uncheck suspension and then I'll just put like like uh, a camber uh, adjusting modification for street class. I should. I think you should leave suspension. That counts. No, no, no. It's gonna muddy up the okay. results because I don't. I don't want to have to put coilovers or whatever on stuff. True. Right. So, all right. If you were to buy slash build a car specifically for autocross or with autocross as the primary factor in your choice, what age of car do you prefer? Probably like two to four, because it's like still like mostly in warranty. Yeah. So it's like new two to four, five to seven, eight, eight or older, or I don't care. Yeah. I think I put two to four as well. I think. And no preference, or and I probably put no preference. You probably put no preference. I don't remember. I, I took it a week ago or something. You know what? Actually, I think I'm no preference either. I really don't care what how old the car is. I just want the car to be fun. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what the age of the car is for it to be fun. Okay. How long do you prefer to campaign a car in autocross? No preference. As long as the, as long as the class is relevant, right? I put one to four years because I would get so bored if I had to do it longer than that. Oh. But I'm probably, I'm probably, he, he knows, <laughs> probably messing up. I'm probably messing up their survey results a little. But that's my, but that's my opinion. I'm part of the club. Ido accused me of not having a backbone. 
in the chat. Uh oh, oh no, because <laughs> wait, he says I'm actively changing your answers. I'm not. No, I just as we're having a conversation about it, this is this is where we're ending up. <laughs> Uh, how many autocross events do you participate in annually? I would say 11, 11 plus. It gives you a range of uh, from zero to 11. Um, yep. What percentage of autocross do you participate that are um, SCCA events? I would say vast majority of them. All right. Uh, so please rank below what aspects of autocross feel most important to you. One is least important. Five is, or one is most important. Five is least important. All right. Oof. Okay. Uh, it's an interesting one. Yeah. So, so we've got level of competition, number of competitors, facility, having fun with friends, just getting to have fun in the car. So there's five options. I don't want to tell you what I did. I want to let you just kind of. Yeah. Why don't you just, I'm, I'm thinking about it. You just, uh, you tell the, you tell the people what we're doing, All what, right. what I have so far. So I put for the sake of autocross, I put, just getting to have fun in the car, driving fun as my number one. Then I put the level of competition. Then I put facility. Then I put number of competitors. And then I put having fun with my friends. Because I feel like you can do that anywhere. That's kind of a bogus answer that I think they're, I don't know if I like that. What is facility? Is that like means like there's a, there's a nice place to pee? Like, are you the snob that's only going to go to Toledo because it's smooth and flat and fast? Or are you going to go to the little local Sandy lot too? Like level of, level of sight is, is how I took it. Oh, gotcha. Hmm. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I wonder if it's... I, uh... <laughs> why, why aren't this... Okay. All right. So I went as my number one was level of competition because I don't want to... Um, I don't want to just show up and like run away with it i want to feel i want to feel that excitement of like i could lose this thing at any moment i got to bring out my best self right that, that's what i find fun with autocross is like that that like interesting somebody's gonna beat me like stress i like that yeah um number i know that about you but i also it's interesting that i put that i want to have fun with the car first like i've had some of my most fun where i've had no competition or at small events where i'm in my own class but i can only use packs some of my most fun events were like that, actually. Well, I think at local, so that's so interesting. Local, I'm I'm thinking of like a national event for this. Um, I don't really sure. think about. I I like I think at local events, like uh, we we think about packs more than anything. But you think about packs at national events. But I'm typically not in cars that like even have a chance in packs at at national events. Sure. Yeah, I literally only care about packs, to be honest. Right. I know so, people don't like packs so and stuff, but I only care about You're driving cars that. that do well in packs at national events. So, like, that's, that's your well, level of competition. Well, I don't choose because of packs, but I only, when I'm looking at results, if I wasn't eligible to win packs because I didn't win my class, then I'm, then I obviously it's already irrelevant. And I probably was like, I don't know what happened. Or if I like can't win packs because the class is bad for the site or whatever, then that is what it is. I can still try to get as high as possible, but I feel like my measure. If I aim for winning packs all the time, that is a semi-mathematical and like results given way to know that I did the best job possible. Yeah, I hear you. Because I technically beat everyone on site, both in my class and not. So I, I think like the level of competition and then the, the, num the number of that people that are bringing that competition is going to be my most important two things. Um, sure. Like I'll literally drive way farther to go to an event if I know really good people are going to be there. Right. Like there might be a local yeah. that's like right next to me that like is going to be perfectly fine when it comes to like driving a car. But if there's one that's like twice as far away where the people there are like super good and that's the competition that I'm going to have, then I'm, I'm more likely to go to that one. Right. So um, can I tell a funny story about this. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> when I was co-driving with Dave Montgomery, uh, we co-drove together for like three years, probably. And uh, he always used to joke about ever, every single event. Uh, his, dad was at, his dad was at every event, but his mom almost never came. And after he would like send his mom an update and she would always ask, how many people were there? And he was always like, it doesn't matter how many people were there. If I, like, if I got first or second, or, like who cares how many people were there? <laughs> and I always thought that was really funny that she was always <laughs> like, how many people did you beat? Or how many people were there? <laughs> Um, it's like, oh, it doesn't matter. 
Hold on. There is something satisfying when your name's at the top of a list and it's a very long list. It is for sure. So if your name's on the top of a list, like if there's five people and those five people are freaking killers and your name's at the top of that list, that's not nearly satisfi- satisfying if there was 95 other people below those five people. True. I don't Good know point. why. That's, that's just lizard some, brain. Yeah, that's some lizard lizard shit right there. So, um, all right. So I had level of competition, num- number of competitors, just getting to have fun in the car, um, the facility. Uh, so just meaning that the, the it's a nice site. Um, I don't want to drive in a little posted stamp. Um, and then having fun with friends, like like you said, that's uh, you can do that anywhere. Um, but I really do uh, enjoy the the fun having uh, at uh, just any motorsports event because you're just with your people, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. On to the question sixteen. What would you say is your single biggest motivator for you to participate in autocross? Um. All right. So competition, desire to win, fun uh, slash the enjoyment of driving, community and friendship driver and or vehicle development uh leadership uh contributing being part of a team or other um is this where i put camber plates tom <laughs> <laughs> yes for sure <laughs> uh com- competition i that's i mean that's the single single biggest motivator so. i also put competition and i realized i contradicted myself in you the did. last two questions but that is what it is <laughs> so oh, well. wait hold on <laughs> we gotta we gotta we gotta break into this if you so you have um because it's different it says level of competition for the previous question but this one is competition slash or hyphen desire to win okay i don't know what the, like the, it struck me different it's like i go because i really want to like win but then when i'm there like the most important thing to me it somehow is like getting to drive the car I don't know. Don't make me unpack it. This isn't therapy. I just said what I said. <laughs> this isn't therapy. It could be. Um, all right. Uh, all right. So if an event is attractive to you, how far are you willing to travel for a single day event? Uh, I wish they did it by time because miles is not. Yeah, I don't know how, I, how many hours is 200 miles. Like four. I have no idea. It's like three and a half, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've done that. Or before. podcast lengths. How many podcasts would you get through in a? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I they have less than a hundred miles, uh, all the way to two hundred miles to three hundred miles or more than three hundred miles. I picked uh the one hundred to two hundred mile uh option. Um, I think anything more than a single day event, uh, would be. I don't know. I, I feel like that'd be kind of a. A little bit of a waste. I, I could find something else, right? <laughs> yep. Within the same radius. Okay. Then a multi-day event. Uh, I'd do three. I'd do three hundred plus miles for that. I don't know why that yep. extra day makes that much of a difference, but. Um, what is the minimal number of runs runs at an event to make it feel valuable? Big question. I don't. I don't care. Really? Yeah. I don't. That's okay. So the options for the options are three to four, five to six, or seven or more. There's only three options. You you go to an event, and you would feel completely fine. If I got if I got an an event, if you got three or four runs, I think the minimal that's not on here because I picked uh, three to four. I think the minimal would be two. Oh, no, 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 no. That's a wild perspective. (laughs) All right, you want to unpack it a little bit. No. <laughs> so I, I honestly, if I go to, besides signing up for a national event, which is reminder, it's six, it's not three, you get three per day. If I go to a local event and I don't get at least five runs, I feel so cheated. And I think the, the event is lazy and I think they need better leadership. And I think they need to like figure out their stuff. Cause like, how is it possible? Unless someone like blows their engine and has five hours of oil spill cleanup to do. Like we had that at that, at that Akron event. Like, what are we doing? How do I only get four? Um, you're content with four runs, three runs to me. Like most of the game is not even the driving the car. It's like figuring out what to, what to do. And then you execute on that plan. That's why I was saying too. So you, you reevaluate your plan after the first one, and then you try to put it together for the second one. That's like, that's the game. That's the game that I like. Okay. 
but to to contextualize that within like other stuff i always say that if i can't get to the like the max if i can't be on pole position within three laps i should have done better that's my like road course i don't actually do that but if i can do that that's like how i'm measuring myself like telling yourself that you're fine with only two because you're going to leave the second run with like i there was still more that's but i still got to compete like the the competing is like the the part that's that's the fun part also that kind of sounds you remember like uh with gltc like top 10 shootout you only did one lap but how fun was that one lap tom because you had to put well, it that, together that one lap was my 30th lap of the weekend like but, if i don't have it down by then what am i doing but, if i've if i've won a race <laughs> you know <laughs> so but hold on hold on hear me out hear me out because uh because there's so much more um pressure on that one lap like to perform and do the thing like if you get yeah. less runs then that just like it like condenses the fun or like the the competition into that like those couple runs if you show up to an event you get freaking eight runs i don't know in my experience those, it doesn't like you might set the fastest time at the end. You might not, but like generally like, at, like by the third or fourth, fifth run, you've set your fastest time. And then you're just kind of setting the same times for like the, the rest of the thing. And you never really improve. I'm with you. I think, I think four to five is the sweet spot, but if I only get four, I'm mad about it. And if I get five, I feel like I got my value. Gotcha. Just cause we're already doing so little, like, what, how are we not getting more than four runs? So I, I think it I think it changes between like a national event and uh, a local. But a national event is six runs, guaranteed. You paid your money, six runs. Yeah. I'm mostly trying to make sure you don't put three so they don't think they can just give you three event runs. You're going to go ahead. Okay, um, <laughs> go for I'm it. I'm Nexon. <laughs> All right. How would you rank the attractiveness of the following podcasts? Oof, Tom. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> No, First up. That's not what the question says. <laughs> Track walking. Okay. Uh, how would you rank the attractiveness of the following class styles? One being most attractive, four being least attractive. Um, we're going to put this at the bottom because that requires money. <laughs> you want to just yep. commentate what I'm doing? <laughs> okay. Uh, the options are run what you brung, build anything you want, basically. Uh, fun classes, even less serious with even sillier rules. Spec classes, where all the cars are the same, or limited prep, where the choice of make and model is very similar performance, um, are the four options. Okay. So I believe that I put, I believe that I put um, limited prep first, run what you brung second, fun, no, limited uh, spec classes third, and fun fourth. All right. Fun meaning silly. And I, I put spec classes top. Uh, just because it's all about the driver. Limited prep mm -hmm. classes, second, because I feel like that would probably, um, that includes like stuff like the ST classes and stuff like that, right? Uh, yep. Fun classes, third. Actually, it's, it's probably like a tie. Uh, I don't really know what, that, what, that, what that's asking. I'm, basically, I'm thinking of this is streak. like, I think it is. It's so, like, would you rather drive like an X prepared car or a mean street car? That's no, how I took the... yeah, I would, I would rather do a, a X prepared. So, okay. So run what you're brung is third now. And then fun classes is fourth. That's like meme street or whatever. Right. It, it says silly rules with an emphasis on fun and inclusion. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Tom's broken. <laughs> what, what, what class is that? There's no classes that are like that except for meme street. Meme street, right? Maybe they okay, like, so the, they saw that they saw that Crown Vic with the like the yeah. the, the neon cat or whatever on it. They at, probably did at Solo Nationals, and they're like, "Do we need more of that?" Yeah, like a lemons style like class. Honestly, I think people would be about it. I think they would too. I would not be about but it. I was, but I, I was think, intrigued I think by the inclusion of that on there. Yeah. Sorry, I, I cut you off. What did you say? I I don't think. I don't think we would find enjoyment in that, but I think there is a large portion of people that would find enjoyment in that, in like that type of self-expression. Like just think about all the golf carts driving around in solo nationals that are like decorated. Right. If people would also like just decorate their car and like that was part of the competition. I don't know. I think people might be into that. Not my thing, but I'm not going to, I'm not, as Tom would say, I'm not going to yuck their yum. Right, Tom? Don't do it. 
All right. If rules were not a factor, what is your preference of tire for autocross? Hmm. What does that even mean? If rules were not a factor. Like if you didn't have to buy a specific tire, what would you want to drive on? Mm. And the options are normal street tires, meaning 300 tread wear, high performance street tires, 200 tread wear, DOT race tires, DOT rated, but unlimited tread wear, open, so like proper racing slicks or no preference. Ooh, this one's tough. This is a little tough because I think like normal quote unquote tires, um, when they would just get really hot very quickly and then they would just suck so like you it would you'd have like that it would just be like your first uh, run is not if you only get two runs <laughs> if you get two Which runs you're fine it with. doesn't matter it doesn't <laughs> matter if you get two runs but that's not the world we live in yeah so right <laughs> like like that sounds great because you're like cool yeah we all just drive on crappy tires and the car slides around more and like you know you have to be better right mm -hmm. um but then when it comes to actually like competing on them it would probably be worse because the the heat factor of them would would suck yeah i put 200 treadwear i think 200 treadwear is like worth. literally the best best answer here like dot racing yeah. tires that's gonna include hoosiers which you, like if you're competing at a national event you kind of need new ones to like have your best shot every single time yeah or you you can win on older ones if other people are on older ones but if somebody your same skill level shows up with new tires they beat you Kinda, yeah. So, all right. Well, money no object. Richard, Richard asked in the chat. He said, "Money no object." <laughs> uh, no, it says rules not a factor. It doesn't say money no yeah, object. Yeah, but, but Richard's <laughs> wanting, wondering, money no object. What would you prefer to drive? Oh, bias uh, plies. No, I don't know. I so my my ranking for these would be two hundred first, three hundred second, uh, and then DOT third and open fourth, just because like. Uh, the same logic, 300 treadwear is a little bit tedious sometimes, but I think it's the most fun a lot of times. And then I just think that I don't understand why we would want to compete for the most part in a competition-based sport on like the most expensive thing ever, which well, is actually the next question. Oh, is it? Okay. In general, when purchasing Kinda. tires, rank how the following factors affect your tire buying decisions. Ooh, okay. So cost is the first one and there's, there's three options to pick. Most important, somewhat important, least important. Um, I would say it's somewhat important. Performance, most important, and then longevity, somewhat important. You got to rank them, though. No, that's... Oh, oh, crap. Oh, no, I got to so actually I make decisions here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I actually answered it. I, Excuse me, I accidentally answered this the wrong way. I answered it in what is my preference for buying tires, not in what I actually would do. So if I did it, if I actually, what I actually do, performance is one, cost is two, longevity is three, probably. Three, but what three I would being, rather is... Three being like the most important? No, meaning it's the most important to have the most per performance. Then it's the most, then if I had two tires that one was cheaper than the other, but they had the same performance, I would buy that one. And then the longevity of whatever I buy is probably the least important thing to me in competition. But if I got to pick, like if it was like, if rules weren't a factor, like the previous question, I would say the cost is the most important thing, then the longevity, then the performance. Cause I still like to, again, I don't understand why people want to race on the most expensive, shortest lasting tires. Like we're racing each other, not the time. Right. Yeah, if you just decide if everyone just decided not to buy the most expensive tires, then we would all save money. Um, well, that's kind of that's how spec class works. Tom, can I interest you in SSC? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to do a spec class on Kumos. <laughs> that's what I want. Um, I would rather it on Bridgestones. Oh, yeah, you're, you're biased. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, in general, when purchasing tires, rank the following factors. So I, I have to pick. So... Like when I'm, if, if I was buying tires for a car that I'm competing in, uh, performance would be, uh, most, well, longevity and cost is kind of the same thing, right? Uh, I guess no, cost, they can cost the same in the last half as long and then they cost twice as much. Yeah. I think longevity is like how useful, like how long they're, um, uh, competitive, right? So I'll put that somewhat important and then cost is least important. It makes it look like I want to spend a million dollars in tires, but that's, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's 
if I was picking a tire to put on my autocross car, that's that's how I would rate it. All right, what is your comfort level in investing in a vehicle intended for autocross? <laughs> I'm a, I am a, a bad metric for this. <laughs> well, you're part of the thing. That's why it's a little interesting. Is I guarantee there's so many different answers for this. Um, I I put ten to twenty. Well, okay. So when I, um, when autocross was my main function of competition, I I literally bought a new Miata just to go competing. So, uh, I guess I would have picked this one. But at the current moment, uh, I would be like, so I picked the t- twenty to thirty thousand dollar pick. Um, but my, what is my current comfort level? Like I, I can't, I can't spend anything, you know, I, I can't, I can't spend anything on anything. So I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm not a good metric for this. So I'm just going to mark the no more than $10,000, uh, option. So, all right. Ooh, what's my favorite thing about SCCA solo slash autocross? Oh, I don't know. If I had to pick Amber- one. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I put it. Camera plates. <laughs> um, I don't. I feel like this isn't what they're asking about in this. Um, this no, uh, no, survey. In the last, I would put it in the twenty sixth box, where it's just like anything else you want to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the previous two questions are the biggest thinkers for me. We spent more time on the other ones. I thought we would, but it was sorry. Good. It was interesting. No, no, not sorry. No, it's inter- it's, it was interesting. But the the next question, while DJ types in his camber thing uh is what's your favorite thing about scca autocross sounds like yours is pretty simple competition yeah yeah basically uh uh fair place to compete like the integrity of the competition is really important to me yeah i like that i think i put that autocross is my famous my favorite famous my favorite form of motorsports like if i had to pick something for the rest of my life i feel like autocross is my favorite raw form of motorsport if you remove everything else and scca does the best versions of those events most regularly so it's like the obvious most common place that i can do my favorite activity that makes sense yeah all right so I, I, I said, uh, what is your favorite thing about SCCA slow, solo slash autocross? Fair place to compete. The integrity of competition is super important to me. And I think the SCCA does a, a pretty good job on that. Um, mm-hmm. Just the way it's structured uh, with like the self-policing. Um, yep. What is one thing you would like to improve about SCCA slash autocross? And I put less classes. There's too many classes. <laughs> No, I say that, and I wish the I wish the GR86 had a place to play in uh, ST. So, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say you sound like you sound like such an old person when you say that. Do, You're do not I, wrong, but it's the funniest, like most basic. What would you say? Every 50 year old SCCA. What What would you what want to improve on? Yeah, I I put that I wish I wish that they would le- allow autocross to be legitimate, in the same way that like most the top level of most sports is broadcast in some way. And autocross, for some reason, is treated like it's not worth watching. It's not worth covering. It's not interesting enough. And to me, when you get like on ground level, 10 feet from an autocross car and you see it moving across the surface and you see a driver doing a good job and you see like the competition when like the car number 198 comes across the line and they got the win at nationals on the third run. Look, I got chills. Yeah. And then 199 does it too. And the, auto, the announcer loses their mind. I don't see any reason why autocross couldn't be given a more legitimate coverage in the sense of like making it actually look as cool as it is the same way that like, dude, have you, if you haven't seen some of these drifting events, the drifting events are in these tiny little rinky dink places and they make it look like the coolest thing ever. They have fire spitting up behind the cars and sparks and lasers and they like <laughs> they have smoke everywhere. I'm, sw- I'm serious. They like have these arena stadium things in, in Europe and formula drift is even pretty cool. And yet we go to nationals and they don't make a single effort to make it even covered with video other than that silly video that comes out five months later, which everyone loves it, but I'm sorry, it's pathetic. (laughs) Oop, oop, oop. (laughs) Like we should have like full competition coverage. And like, I don't see why other than like logistics, 
like you know how coda has like big paint sections and stuff like make a feature corner and like put out a thing that's like red around the inside of it and make it look like that's the the feature corner of the course and stuff you know like it, if I could, if I could dream big, I would do that treatment to autocross, like Olympics. It, it would be cool, or even like runoffs level. Yeah, it would be cool. Well, so I think in order for that to happen, you have to have less classes because they can't cover eighty classes or whatever. Or right? do what like runoffs when they did runoffs, they would do a pretty a pretty like low ver before it was only on YouTube, but before we would do these are the ten classes that are eligible for the television package, and it was the ten classes that they could guarantee of that ten eight were going to be good enough for television and then they would cover all of those in a different way that had like commercial throws and it had a little bit of a more grandeur to it yeah and then when those the eight of those 10 that were the best went to tv so you could pick like you know ssc is going to be the best you know super street's probably going to be really amazing you yeah, know str str yeah like yeah. pick 10 and then do them all in the same day so you yeah. only have to have your camera crew on Damn. the ground tom you're get good five cameras I'm saying, and autocross is worth that, dude. If they did it a good job, it's worth it. Dude, I know it would be. I'm 100% with you. I, I think that would work. Like, you have, like, pit reporters, and you, like, go and talk to somebody after a run, and then, like, you're talking to them just as somebody comes across and beats their time, and you get that live reaction where they're like, oh, it's freaking go time, right? You get that human aspect of it. If they focused on the cars at all, it would be dead for me. But if they focus on the humans yeah. and the, the nerves, like... You know, you know, you always see it. It's somebody did their run. They're in the lead. They've done their last run. All they have, to, all they're doing now is waiting. They're waiting to see if that person who is in reach can actually do the time that they need. You get to see either that excitement or that heartbreak, right? That yep. is interesting. I'm getting chills thinking about it, Tom. Me too. And <laughs> I was, I was thinking about this the other day because of this question. And as like, I went big with my answer because that's like a pretty big. That's never going to happen. I'm aware of that, but it's my honest answer. I think it's worth that coverage, but I would include the car coverage on the course. Cause I think, like I said, if you got a camera two feet off the ground, 10 feet from the car, like zoomed and panned, like, you know how formula one qualifying is really good. Yeah. Like you, obviously we we're never going to get that, but it, autocross would look incredible if they did. Um, like static, oh, static I've, cams, nice and low. Like they'll have one, like at the end of the slalom. Or like pan as the car comes into the f the feature corner and yeah, uh, and then like you know follow it through the corner. That would be pretty. And I think cool. you could. There's only five corner stations per course. You could do five cameras. It would be so so easy. Uh, I don't want to say that because it's. I know it's really hard, but it would it would work. It would be possible. Um, the part I was thinking about though, I think the only time that I won a national championship when I wasn't the one on the sideline was the first one. Because I think I was the last car. So I was still, I, I wasn't the last car, but I was still in the car as I was coming through grid. No, that's not true. That's not true. I was, I was a single driver. I think I've been in that stressful position where you're like watching, looking at the course with no control over what's happening. Yeah. Every, every championship I won. And it is like the craziest feeling. Because I, I know exactly where my brain would be. Be like, you're thinking of all the mistakes you made and how, how you left time here and you left time there and, and, and so-and-so is going to go get it. And you're just like, you're watching the run and it looks good. And you're like, Oh my God. Oh, here they come. And they come across and you look up and you see the time and you're like, oh, they didn't do it. Right. Yep. Yeah. I got chills thinking about it. I haven't, I haven't won one yet. Cause I keep, I keep chasing these, uh, these super tough classes, but, um, when I eventually do win it, I'm going to, I'm going to just turn into a pile of goo and just cry. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be there when that happens. Um, it's like it's like something. Uh, yeah, uh, national uh, championship in autocross is like something that's like super super special. Like people think of all the thousands and thousands of people who've chased it, and then all the thousands of thousands of people who have never gotten it. Right. Yep. So, yeah, someday. I haven't. I haven't won one yet. I'm gonna say I said when it happens, not if it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's 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 the 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 SCCA uh, survey. Uh, I think the SCCA is doing a lot of good stuff right now, dude. Yeah, I I really I really like that uh, scope of that survey. Do you want to throw the lizard brain banner back up? Oh, good call. <clears throat> oh, it there would be is. cool. It would be cool to pay uh, to not work. 
<laughs> oh, did you already submit? I did. Uh, you have to put it gets... in Carlton's. <laughs> Carlton's. <laughs> I just make one yeah. where it's just like straight up car guy. He's there, <laughs> he's there for the socials and like competitions at the lowest. But also to spend the most money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to submit. Uh, I don't want to submit that one because I don't want to skew the results. Yeah. I, don't, I don't want them to think like, you know what? There's we're getting some results in here where people uh, don't think they're spending enough money. I think we need to make them spend more. Yeah. So if they and did, travel further, <laughs> if they did that broadcast thing, uh, the entry fees would probably have to go up though, right? Uh, or they'd have to stop. They'd or have to like. Or fan. distribute the wealth a little bit better. One of the two. Yeah. But yeah. Or like find advertisements because people would potentially tune in for it and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Lou God, it goes up regardless. Um, and you still I... have to work. <laughs> um, how long have we been going? Are we into emails already? Or... Uh, I don't know. You want to talk about one lap for a second? At least what we're going to do? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we should have started the show yeah. with what, what our plans for one lap was. So people... Because I, I bet a lot of people will listen to the first half hour and then they fall off and then they mean to come back and they never do, right? They go, oh, they're talking about autocross off. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we are planning on recording an episode every single day of One Lap. Is that going to start on Friday, Tom? Depends on when you get there, but I think it should. Okay. I want, what I want to, I want to, I am so excited to watch your, cause I only did my first one lap three years ago, so it's still pretty fresh, but I, I'm so excited to watch you experience your first one lap and hear your perspectives. Cause even just from that survey, we think of things so differently sometimes. And I'm going to get to like, hear your updates in real time. Yeah. Um, what time should I get there on Friday? <laughs> so Friday, um, I don't even remember where you left off, but we're going to do daily episodes. I don't know how we're going to put them up. We'll get there. But, um, Friday is called sticker day. So you go through tech, you go through registration. That's all it takes like 10 minutes. Uh, they paint the sidewall of your tire brand on the side of the, the all four tires. So you can't change them. And then they give you a sticker packet of like 40 stickers that you have to put on the car. And that's why all the cars are completely coated in stickers by the, like every single event. Gotcha. So you spend the day, literally the guy from Coors beer brings like all, a, a, everyone brings a ton of beer. And everyone's drinking in a parking lot at one o'clock in the afternoon, putting stickers on their car. Okay. So for your sake, you don't need to rush. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be but, just, um, I'll be, I'll be slamming down Red Bull cans. Woo! Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think you need to be there before the driver's meeting, really, unless Peter tells you to, which I think is at like three. Okay. Four? I'll, I'll double check with Peter. He, he wanted me to be there like uh, kind of early. So you might be on sticker duty. <laughs> oh no. I don't think Peter understands how bad I am at stickers. <laughs> we got to get there kind of early because we have to get tires mounted so oh we'll be there pretty early i think we're trying so right now we're on um uh, like two two forty five, two eighty five. 285 um but we might have located a set of 255 295s so we're we're trying to put those uh larger tires on gotcha is it from Rockwell Autosport? Because that's the size we run on that Cayman. <laughs> Is it? Do you have some? <laughs> Actually, kind of you lot, do. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say. Because uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I think Peter was trying to order some off of uh, Tire Rack, but, um, but I think they were sold out. Tom took them all. You son of a bitch. Sabotaging my, I know there's at least... my one lap. <laughs> I know there's a one WRL weekend's worth sitting in New Jersey, but I don't know how to get it there fast enough yeah, for you. Yeah, probably not. I, I think... Um, I think one of the competitors that had to go to their backup one lap car um, is uh, they have a set. So we might be on those. Big Marcus? Yeah. He was going to run 295s on the back of that Porsche? I think so. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Huh. Anyway, so yeah, unless you have to do tire stuff for like mounting and all that shit, then you don't have to get there early for that day. Okay. Well, I'll double check, but we're planning on releasing an episode every day of the competition. Uh, so we'll probably record it midday. And so it's just going to get uploaded when it gets uploaded. I'm not going to schedule it. It's just when we get done recording, I'm going to throw it on the internet. So um, perfect. not entirely sure how I'm going to do that yet. 
what kind of like is it like uploading a youtube video or an instagram post like what where are we on the spectrum it's uh it takes a little while to um because it records in a format that i can't upload because the files are too big so i have yeah. to transfer it over to a laptop that's going to take a while because the laptop's really slow so maybe we could roughly aim to record and transfer to the laptop at the track yep and then upload at the hotel at night or something no the upload would would happen really quick it's mostly like the time it, the laptop just has to sit there powered on for probably like 45 minutes while the the file like changes from dot wave to mp3 it's going to take a Got while it. so <clears throat> that that's going to be the most time consuming part um but the the upload will be uh, easy honestly if the episodes are shorter, because I can upload dot wave to our podcast hosting thing, but the file sizes are always too big. So if yeah. if they're just like half hour, 45 minute, like little blurbs, then the file sizes might be within range where I can just upload a that file format and it wouldn't it would be actually really, really fast. I hope we can do that. I don't think we'll talk for more than thirty ha half 30, hour. Thirty to forty minutes tops. Like there's not that much to talk about. Yeah. But somehow we always end up talking for an hour and a half. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so well, there'll be like shorter episodes, but I it's probably going to be the best way for people to follow along with one lap. Obviously, follow along on our Instagrams because we'll be doing uh, stories and little updates as uh, as things happen. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm uh, super excited. It is so hard to get any work done this week, Tom. I'm uh, I'm just thinking about how I get to go do one lap for the whole week, and it's uh, making it hard to focus on emails. Uh, I can see that. So. I remember when I had a real job, how bad I was on the Thursday before leaving. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. You talking about one lap? 13 years ago. Oh, okay. Or just uh, the Thursday before leaving for a fun thing. Yeah. 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 I'll be pretty worthless coming back too. How's the, how's the transfer back to reality? That's probably pretty tough, right? Uh, my lifestyle is different, so I don't know for sure. But you finish by like... Well, you have to leave Sunday, Saturday anyway, right? I do, yeah. By a certain time. So you're going to be gone Saturday. You have all of Sunday to recover. I don't think you'll be that bad by Monday. Okay. Well, I still have to go back to reality. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be interested to hear about how much you think of that because I guess I've never really talked about it with anybody but like Andy and Alex before. And Alex is self-employed and Andy is self-employed. So I don't, I don't really know. Yeah. Well, I'll let you know. When we, when we record uh, the, the next... so. Next week won't have um, a normal like episode of the podcast. It will just be all those like mini episodes. I think I'm going to call it episode like what is this ninety three. I'm going to call that like episode like ninety four A B C D like because all of that will be episode ninety four. Yep, and maybe we can do a super cut at the end or something. Uh, we read. I'm reading the dude, Adam. He said, the problem is going, the, the car's going oh, around oh, the same we're track. back to autocross. And doing the same thing loses people's attention. Oh, okay. But not. Are you kidding me? Formula One, auto, Formula One qualifying is the most interesting thing that happens. You need weird classes like DJ mentioned. Hey, don't, don't bring that evil on me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like Cletus does with the Freedom 500. Draws more attention. Oh, I see. He's referencing that that they're talking about drift events filling stadiums in the U S maybe not autocross regardless. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, we had some interesting, uh, um, questions asked in the discord, uh, and, saw that. and we had, uh, some carters, uh, get back to us on our, our, based on our conversation uh, from last week. So do you want to dig into those Tom? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Emails. All right. So, uh, Tim, uh, uh, Bruski, uh, friend of the podcast, he said, So, uh, I ran a shifter car in autocross for six years before AMOD, and I want to answer DJ Allison Drini's question and add a few thoughts. I ran autocross for so long because it was a super wild ride full of, uh, I think he meant carts, uh, full of adrenaline most runs. The adrenaline seems to come from this. Trying to nail this while running on the razor's edge of accuracy, going mock Jesus, all while running a 100-meter sprint race. It's a lot more fun running at a cart 
It is a lot more fun running at a cart track wheel to wheel. Oh, he's saying that autocross is more fun than the wheel to wheel. Um, for me, the nearest outdoor track was small with barriers and not something I even wanted to potentially hit. A cart track that is big enough with runoff is ne- is really necessary for those carts. You know what? That makes sense because you really could hurt yourself Doesn't with how sense. fast those things are. Um, yep. Plus, finding other similar carts. Drivers, like DJ said, there's a wide range of cart and driver speed. Um, another thing is that you, if you don't want to spend money on tires, carting is the way to go. Uh, when I uh, got out of carting, a full set of MG Greens, not sure what that means, was $226 for a full set of tires. That's not, that's not too bad. Um, you were right saying there is a lot of poten- potential. Uh, there is po- a lot of time potentially left out there in so many ways. Also, if conditions are right, there is uh, the potential to be a semi-seriously injured without any collision. Uh <laughs> I thought you were trying to sell me on this, uh, Tim. <laughs> um, I still have what looks like scoliosis in my spine from being a bit offline, hitting a small bump while turning near, uh, while turning at near maximum load. And I even had a rib protector on. It would be so much faster and way more fun uh, when Ian, so now he's referring to uh, the cart that you drove last week. Which, by the way, I found out he calculated is geared for 119 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's, that explains why we only use third, which was 74. Yeah. Which means that you were cooking even with uh, interesting gear ratios. Yeah. What, what car First track was geared for 45. <laughs> Hold on. What, what car track are you going 119 miles an hour on? Like a real one. No, proper... there's no way. Uh huh. You think they're that fast? We're going like a hundred something. Yeah, there, I mean, maybe not even shift. This he said this cart's been on Mid Ohio before. Ian oh, did. so it, it could have been, it could have been. But I've been to I've been to race tracks like cart tracks with configurations I've seen straightaways long enough that I would believe with the way it accelerates if you're in the right gear and everything. Yeah, I could see it getting to 100, 115. Damn, I kind of want to drive some carts, Tom. Um, uh. Tim says that it's literally 10 minutes to change the gearing. So, uh, and that there's an app that you can, uh, use to jet the carbs because uh, that's a thing that you have to do to make the most amount of power. So you probably put in like barometric pressure and like temperature and altitude and all that stuff. And then it tells you exactly what jets to put in there. It's the, it's the thing that sprays the fuel into the piston. I think Tom, did I lose you? Nope. I'm reading something real quick. Sorry. Gotcha. <laughs> I thought I thought Tom was done forever. I mean, you are talking about car stuff. Um, changing jets and <laughs> <laughs> Jake Martin, big cart guy energy. Um, so he says, uh, "P.S. Larry McLeod is a big fat liar. He told me that everyone gets the finger when they leave cart mod, unless you leave for a mod." Uh, I left for a mod and still got the finger. And then he posted a picture of a bunch of people carding um, that uh, are all flipping them off. What a wonderful community, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, okay, so Larry also responded because I, I forgot to message Larry about this, but I think he's with us live right now. Um, I'm on the wrong screen. Uh, partially, I'm like switching back and forth between our two things. How much time do we have? Should we, can Larry, can you talk on the podcast right now? Is Larry here? Larry, He's raise your hand. Live, right? yeah, he Larry. may not be able to talk right away. Yeah, yeah. Raise your hand, Larry, and we'll bring you on stage. If you have a way to talk, that might be interesting for a couple minutes, but otherwise we can just read your message. Larry? Larry? Hello? Is Larry, are you there? He's got to pull his noodle neck up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm here. Okay. Uh, how, here do I, how do I bring him up here? I forget. There we are. Like that. Hi, Larry. Larry. You're muted. Oh. Larry McLeod. Larry Lefty McLeod, welcome to the hey. podcast. You, you think I'd know how to turn a microphone off mute? <laughs> I was going to say, you got two-fourths. Two-fourths. <sighs> you got one half of the uh, runoff broadcast team now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, welcome. Uh, okay. So, Larry, you mentioned uh, it. I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts about this. like basically that I hit the nail on the head with how frustrating it would be 
or how frustrating it is. And that's why it keeps you coming back. But you've autocrossed real cars too, or full size cars, I should say. Like, what's the, I don't, I'm curious where, like, I, I can kind of think about it, but why do you think that is? What, like, what's, I don't know, is, is there, are there actually that many more variables? Yeah, what that's what it, that's what the challenge is. It, in the cart, you get variables that you just don't have in a car. It, as you notice, you with only three speeds, it's hard to be in the right gear all the time, but that's one of the biggest challenges. If you miss a shift, it's a half a second. You tap a braking point wrong, you pitch it sideways the wrong point, you lost time. So that it's that challenge that drive for perfection day in, day out, event to event, always trying to be perfect, that is the challenge. It's competition is one thing, but it's the strive for perfection that's really where it comes in. Would you say that the cart is way more of a variable than a than a full size car? And that's like what that makes it way more of a factor for the perfection? I, I'm only asking because I've only driven like six runs in one, so I don't really know. Yeah, yeah, because in a in a full size car, everything just happens a little slower. The the responsiveness you have to kind of, as you know, with a car, everything kind of moves just a little slower. Whether it's acceleration, whether it's the weight transfer, in the cart, everything is instant, which means you can make you can turn an instant mistake into a problem. Uh, and there's, and there's car, almost never shifting in a car, yeah. Yeah, and then you throw in the shifting and the fact that there is no suspension and your your body is such a huge variable too because you shift your weight a little bit in, a little bit out, you're going to change the handling of the car in a cart. Um, and that, that doesn't come into play in a car. So all of that is just to try and get it right. It's a dance. It's a, I, it's, it's sometimes hard to describe, but you've driven them now, so you know how hard it is to kind of keep that thing on that knife's edge to get that, rear to hike to transfer the weight and hold it there to do that in a three run nationals is just so difficult that I still, every time I go out to the van, I'm just trying to do it better than the last time. I just try and be a little better. Cause it's, it's hard. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just still interested by the contrast. Cause like when, when Dave got the 914, we took it to the first mm -hmm. event, obviously that's like a, everything up to, but not including a tube frame race car that's like wildly modified and it was on bias plies and it was really weird to drive for the first run, but it didn't make me walk away saying like, I need a season for that. And the cart did. But I also want to know like, how much of that do you think was down to it being geared for 120 miles an hour instead of 80 or whatever? Like is, what are you geared for normally? Like 85, 90, maybe tops? No, I'm normally geared for like about 75, maybe, oh. maybe 80 on a certain <laughs> longer course, but nothing more than that. Okay. That's wild. How much of that do you think was just like? <clears throat> that's, that's a lot. I think your frustration could easily be that, that you just, you're never in the right gear and the cart's not letting you because you're just geared for, you know, mid Ohio. Um, I think you would have walked away still <laughs> not full scratching your head, but probably saying it's still a, a pretty big learning curve. I think you could get there faster than a couple. I think give you like a 30 run test and tune. I think you'd be right there. Yeah. Cause I found, I mean, I've done like, I've done rental carting a lot, which is close-ish. Okay. It may, okay, it's like 60% close. And then I've done a tag cart, which is no shifting, but pretty similar power, like delivery. Mm -hmm. So the cart driving, it didn't feel that hard, but like putting the thing together made it feel like it was so hard. Oh my God, it was so hard. So maybe the driving was hard. I don't even, but it was like the variables outside of when I was in the normal driving mode that was just like, what the hell? When I, when I took it's yeah, it's just different. It's different because and you're used to what a car does. And, and the 914 is probably the closest you've gotten to a car, just in the dynamics of it and the well, fact that it's just so fast. <laughs> and like C mod and F mod and stuff, but there's sure. like all of those extra variables are still removed that the cart adds in there. What I'm curious actually now, I have to ask Dave, because he put a sequential in the 914 and it's geared to use the first four gears on an mm. autocross course. I wonder if he'll have like some of these cart mod uh learning <laughs> curves might. to deal yeah, with you might <laughs> yeah he literally that, turned that the would be interesting to, to get that feedback yeah he literally turned the 914 into a shifter cart <laughs> yeah <laughs> crazy yeah well the other thing in a cart that you also get in down in peru you would have had a little bit of this too is the bumps that the bumps start to throw you offline you have to kind of plan ahead that you don't normally do that much of in a car um, yeah, it's that's it's just specific to autocross. That's something we always have to think about. I, like I, to... I know where every bump is in Lincoln. I know every bump is in Oscoda. I know there's bumps in Toledo. I know that sounds crazy, but there are. I believe that. I tried to warn. Tom. I had that happen. Go ahead, DJ. What? Oh, I said I tried to warn Tom about like when you're walking the course for a cart, you actually have to pay attention to the 
like the little cracks in the pavement and stuff because like it actually comes into play. Yeah, we did. And we, we identified like three of them and we were right about two of them, but it only affected me one run, which unfortunately was one of the runs that I got the card off the line kind of okay. So I was like, oh, I blew oh, the run again. It. Like I actually <laughs> drove bad that time instead of just not being able to drive. Uh, okay, that's cool. That's good perspective. Yeah. I think I, um, like I said, I would want to do it like a lot more if I was yeah. going to do it more. <laughs> <laughs> you can't dabble in a cart. Yeah, I guess. Anyway, how you been otherwise, Larry? You good? I, I've been great. Yeah, in fact, I was getting ready. We had a local event this weekend and then Spring Nationals in about, what, three weeks or so to head out there. So, and yeah, that and time trials are going. So just having a good old time. Summer's fun. Sweet. Hopefully I'll see you at time trials soon. I think I'm trying yeah. to go. Well, I was going to go to Gingerman, but it got canceled, I think, right? It did, yeah. Should have come right. up to uh, Road America. I couldn't, but uh anyway i'll see you soon thanks for uh, <laughs> yep. your perspective i appreciate that right, guys. i'll sleep a little better next time for uh tonight <laughs> thanks All thanks right, for guys. being on the show larry see you okay well that's interesting or good to know that the cart was geared for it probably sounds hyper fixated like on this thing but 75 and 120 is pretty different <laughs> yeah that's uh yeah there's a lot of extra gears in that if you yeah, I was gonna say down. you would have shifted twice as often literally yeah, which that probably would have introduced all sorts of extra shit that I would have to deal with. I'd be like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> I think you would have been not. able to handle it though. Yeah. Yeah, you would have got so. top packs for sure if that card was geared <laughs> properly. The legend of Tom continues. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, all right. Um, I think I think the, um, the Rickster uh, had a interesting question. Uh, do you want to read it or should I read it? Yeah, yeah, I'll go for it. I forgot you didn't, you read the last one. Uh, DJ and Tom, I'm starting to realize more and more that while I love competition and feel like, uh, it's my default state, I struggle. Wait, what? If, if I, I'm starting to realize more and more that while I love competition and feel like that it is my default state, I struggle to balance things. I feel like it's hard for me to improve at the level I want to be at while making time for more relaxing things and time to reset uh, to the point that I'll even playfully beat myself up when I'm not able to play eye racing. I never get to the point of anger or unenjoyment from my competitiveness. So it's hard for me to understand uh, or dr sometimes draw a line or change my thinking day to day. How do you two deal with balancing personal improvement with results and personal time to smell the roses? Hmm. So what do you think? Yeah. I've, I've ran into this, um, just like through, uh, through di different friends, like over the years, uh, where they'll beat themselves up over results when they're not nearly putting in, uh, the same amount of just commitment or effort into the, the task and the competition in the, the conversation always goes like this. It's like, you have to be fair to yourself. You can't, you can't expect the results that you're not putting in the time for. Um, you can be happy with results that go like that show better than whatever amount of effort you're putting in. Like that's, that's definitely like possible. Um, but then when the results indicate the amount of sacrifice and uh, just basically just the, the amount of um, I don't, I don't want to use the word devotion, but like, the amount of bandwidth that y your life is able to be dedicated toward racing. Um, I, I think you just have to be fair. You have to be fair with yourself and exactly what you're going to get out of it. Um, if you are balancing other things in your life, uh, then, you know, I, I think like the, to me, this question is really deep because you have to, you have to figure out what, like, what, what are the important things for you? Um, if your, if your absolute goal is to win, uh, but it's at the detriment of your own mental sanity and health and happiness, um, are you winning? Right? Like, you might be, but like, like you said. Uh, Rick, like you didn't, you didn't 
smell the roses or whatever, right? You might get so caught up in it that you're not even present for when you are winning. Um, so I think you have to put into perspective, like what you're putting into it, um, is going to be like what you're getting out of it. And you also have to keep in perspective of, uh, of like, it, is it worth it to you? Right. Yeah. I'm, there's kind of two parts to this question. I get, I, I think there's like, when I compete or when I go do motorsports, my default is to take it competitively. Like I want to be, I want to do a good job. I want the results to tell me I did a good job. Um, and there's the layer of when I don't get the result that I wanted, or I don't feel like I did a good enough job. Are you beating yourself up because you know, you didn't put in enough time. That's the part. That's the first part of the question. Or the second part is how do I balance having a normal life within the realm of wanting to be competitive within motorsports? So if it comes down to, I have an hour at night to watch something that I can relax to or go to bed a little earlier or spend an hour on iRacing. Like, I'm not sure where he's at, where he's at with this question. It's one of those two things or maybe a little bit of both. Yeah. But I agree with everything you said. I think when it comes to the time, you know, obviously I've dedicated the last 15 years of my life pretty heavily to this. The last 10 has been my career. So I can't speak to how someone lives a normal life <laughs> outside of this Same. <laughs> super well. But my thought would be, I, again, you have to be very realistic with your expectations and give yourself some grace with knowing where the point of diminishing returns is or learning where that is. Because I think you can, like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna choose to spend one night a week, two, three nights a week on the sim rig and you, you, you beat yourself up because you couldn't spend 12 hours doing it and you only spent six, like those extra six hours aren't really gonna change your life anyway because it's building a ladder. It's not just like, you're not, you're not stacking a Jenga thing real fast. You're like, you're playing a slow, yeah. you're playing a slow game. Yeah. So if you're, if you're learning how to like build a realistic expectation of how quickly you can learn, that's one thing, but going to events, I think that's kind of the answer for both really. It's like, I, I've, I've really learned with, with my coaching uh, leaning into like the education of others rather than thinking about it so much for myself that you really can't beat time. Um, and I'll use, I think I talked about it last week, maybe off, off podcast, but I used to co-drive with Darian Taggart. Did I, did I talk about this on the podcast last week? I'm not sure if it's somebody in the audience, if uh, Tom, if Tom talked about this, then, then cut him off. I'll, I'll, I'll use the anecdote anyway. So, Gary and I started co-driving in 2020. We co-drove sometimes into 2021. And his previous co-driver was Robert Thorne. So he basically had two of like I, what I believe are two of the best autocross drivers in the country. If you had a list of 50, we'd be on it probably. As his co-drivers, and he built up this insane expectation of where he should be relative to where he was based on how long he'd been doing the sport. And... I had to talk to him a lot about this and I don't think there was any way for it to sink in. I think it was like, I could say it and say it and say it, but he had to learn to believe it. And since then he's continued to autocross. He has a different car now that's a little less stressful. And he just won the Charlotte tour in STX against a bunch of really fast drivers. And I've been watching his videos. He's driving super well, but you just look at what's, what's the difference in that. Of course, there's a different car, whatever there's the main thing is time. And the way he would speak about driving and the way he was engaged with trying to be better was a hundred percent spot on. And he just didn't want to, he didn't know how to acknowledge that the time was the most important part of that. So now two years later, I guarantee if we ask him, it didn't feel like a slog. I'm sure it didn't feel like brutal and like he was beating himself up, up about it all the time. He used to. And now two years later, he's winning national events against some other drivers that are in that top 50 uh, probably. So I don't know if I answered the question, but I think no, learning I... how to respect the amount of time that it takes, knowing that everyone's amount of time is a little different, but like honing in on that for yourself is probably where I'm getting at. Yeah. Like get, getting good at driving is like, it's all these like little details and these little habits that you build and all these like little tiny sub executable, like subconscious programs running in your head. And you have to build each one of those like slowly, um, like one by one. Uh, and it's all these like tiny little details that like eventually like all come together 
Um, so yeah, if, if you're putting in time, then you will be getting better. It, it, a consistent effort over a long period of time, you can literally do anything. It just has to be consistent and you have to give yourself the time. Now, that being said, a lot of times competition is not just getting better, but you have to get better faster than the other people that you're competing against because they're getting better too. Like everyone's getting better yeah, all the but time. There's also, I mean, we're, we're playing a game of physics. You can only get so good. Like no one's breaking physics. So you're, you're down to minimizing mistakes uh, and managing mistakes by the time you get to the top 95%, let's say. Yeah, when you you're, agree? Yeah, no, no, no. When when you're at the top top, it's it's um it's like the the mental game is is what's going to come into play the most, not the ability to drive the car. Uh Right. But the better the better all of the driving the car like sub executables are, the more like subconscious those things are. Um the more bandwidth can be used for like the the mental game of uh competing in a car. When I reread the question, I think like the, the line about uh, it's hard for me to improve and be at the level I want to be at while making time for more relaxing things and time to reset. So that seems like a life balance thing more than a than a driver. Uh, I don't know, education thing. Yeah. And that's where I feel like I don't know that I have the answer to that question, but to be graceful with yourself and giving yourself the time, like if you're in the right lane of going to the events as often as you physically can or as close to it as you want to and uh you're putting in that consistent effort over a period of time like just maybe it's okay to acknowledge that the amount of time is going to be a little longer than you want it to be or something i don't i don't know that's not a great answer but yeah i i think be patient with yourself and be consistent um yeah you, you know when you stop and smell the roses just make sure you're not stop stopping to smell the roses for like six months like you got to do something <laughs> in that time right because like you don't want to regress um and you don't want to get like too rusty. Uh, so like, for instance, like, let's say, let's say you're like, it's a slog of a week and, and you're trying to get better at iRacing. Well, okay. So you can have two hours of iRacing every week, sitting down on Sunday and doing just two hours straight is going to be way less useful than if you did that two hours in like 20 minute increments, like throughout the week. Because your focus for that first 20 minutes is going to be way better. And then when you jump on, you're not going to be as rusty. So you're not knocking off rust for like the first hour. You're just like jumping right back into the things that you're working on yesterday. And the, and the way our brains work is repetition is going to build uh, the sub executables and like that, that muscle memory way better. Like the repetition and sleeping on it is way better than just like a, a slog into uh, the activity. So yep. if you want to be more efficient with your time, the reps matter more than the duration. I agree. So thank you. Uh, it, his name on uh, Discord is the Rickster, but I'm like drawing the biggest blank on what his actual name is. It's uh, Ricky Howard, right? Yep. Yes. Cool. Got it. Um, all right. Well, we're an hour and 40 minutes into it, Tom. Woo. Woo. So I think uh, I think we're gonna end the show, but uh, we'll have another one out. Um, maybe I'll release this one a little early, <laughs> so people aren't like Thursday Friday shows. Give them a little bit of chance to yeah, screw it. Oh wait, actually, it's Wednesday. Only Wednesday. I, I have to release it anyways. <laughs> Normally I record yeah. these on Tuesday. Um, so uh, guys are looking for like a week and a half straight of lizard brains content. It's gonna be so <laughs> much. Oh my goodness. So um, much Tom and DJ. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be sick of us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, all right. Well, uh, we, we already know what me and Tom's plans are. We're doing one lap this weekend. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> all right. Uh, pretty much. Yeah. Yep. So, cool. okay. Um, Tom, you want to, you want to take us out? Yeah, I guess, you know, whether you're interested in autocross for fun competition or the best site ever, uh, I love your hair, and I hope you win.
I'm hitting wrong buttons. Are we starting again? Nope, I'm just hitting wrong buttons. This is on the video recording, but not the audio one. So, bye everyone. <laughs>